This presentation is on concentrated leak erosion or scour. Concentrated leak erosion led to the failure of Tunbridge Dam, shown to the right, in Tasmania, Australia back in 2005. This presentation will provide an overview of the internal erosion process of concentrated leak erosion and it will describe the hydraulic conditions for its initiation. Starting with an overview of the internal erosion process. In this typical concentrated leak erosion event tree, node 1 assesses the likelihood of a transverse crack existing in the embankment and then given the crack exists, node 2 assesses the likelihood of initiation. These two nodes are the primary focus of this presentation, while the other nodes are discussed in separate presentations. Node 3 assesses the likelihood of an unfiltered exit. Nodes 4 and 6 assess the mechanical conditions for progression. Node 5 assesses the hydraulic condition for progression. And nodes 7 and 8 are unsuccessful intervention and breach respectively. It's good practice to use the generic sequence of events or event tree as a starting point for failure mode evaluation, but then to adapt it for site-specific conditions because not all nodes may apply to a specific dam. In this example, the typical event tree for concentrated leak erosion was adapted to assess concentrated leak erosion at a soil rock interface. Nodes assessing the effectiveness of foundation treatment and the potential for clogging, which could include swelling, were added. The influence of varying crack width across the flow path in the foundation on the gradient will be discussed at the end of this presentation. Ineffective foundation treatment relates to isolating the embankment from the foundation and its open defects. Node 2 assesses the effectiveness of treatments such as dental concrete, foundation shaping, removal of fractured rock blocks and overhangs, air and hand cleaning, slush grouting, concrete bulkheads, filters at the embankment foundation interface, etc. Be cautious of the reliance on grouting to serve as the sole design feature to control seepage. This was done at Teton Dam, mentioned during the introduction presentation, which failed during first filling. Concentrated leak erosion is a form of scour that refers to the internal erosion process involving leakage flow through an opening in the soil or rock mass. Openings can be cracks, gaps, or other defects in the embankment, or open defects in the soil or rock mass in the foundation. The process is distinguished from other processes of internal erosion by the soil particles eroding from the sides of the opening. This figure shows a continuous defect, a horizontal crack through a homogeneous earth-filled dam. Leakage flow through the crack applies shear stresses or tractive forces onto the walls of the crack, and this can lead to particle detachment from the walls of the crack, as shown in the zoomed view. When an embankment dam is constructed, differential settlements occur across the valley, resulting from parts of the dam being higher than others, settling more as the dam is constructed. This can lead to horizontal strains and potentially cracking or low stress zones subject to hydraulic fracture. This is most likely to occur where the abutments are steep, where there is a step in the foundation profile, or where there is compressible soil in part of the foundation. After construction, the embankment continues to settle differentially, resulting in additional stresses and strains. These are inevitable and occur even for well-constructed dams. The figure on the left illustrates how differential settlements may also result in gaps or cracks opening adjacent to spillway structures. The Bureau of Reclamation's Red Willow Dam experienced cracking over the Old Creek Channel and over the conduit. It has since been upgraded with filters. The cracking over the conduit is a result of the conduit being founded on rock and large differential settlements between the conduit and the embankment in the valley resulting from foundation settlement. The cracking over the Old Creek section is a result of settlements in the creek section being smaller than in the adjacent embankment. The depth of alluvium beneath the embankment in the creek section was smaller because the rock level was higher here than elsewhere, and the creek was infilled with the embankment material. The figure on the right illustrates the accumulation of tensile strains with increasing post-construction settlement as a function of embankment height.
Hydraulic fracture involves the formation and extension of an opening in a soil mass due to increasing water pressure. In the figure, an initial opening forms on the upstream side of the core due to a defect or crack. The water pressure in the initial water-filled crack increases, for example, due to an increase in the reservoir level. If the water pressure in the crack exceeds the sum of the minor principal stress and tensile capacity of the soil to crack tip, then the crack is jacked open and it extends further into the core. The process progresses then from upstream to downstream. Hydraulic fracturing can also occur due to the use of high pressures when drilling with water or air or by pressure grouting. As shown in this list, there are a wide range of mechanisms that can create cracks or other defects through which concentrated leaks can develop. Many of these are related to differential settlement and poorly compacted or high permeability zones in the embankment. These mechanisms will be discussed in greater detail later in this presentation. Whether erosion will initiate in concentrated leaks in a dam or its foundation depends on whether a continuous crack, flaw, or defect exists, whether the forces imposed on the sides of the crack by water flowing through the crack are sufficient to initiate erosion, and whether the flow velocity is sufficient to transport the detached particles in the crack. Situations where concentrated leaks may occur. The series of figures on the left show failure paths that can be associated with structures, foundations, or poor details in the dam. These include locations adjacent to the spillway walls at points A and B, adjacent to the outlet conduit at C, and over irregularities in the foundation at D for the upper part of the embankment and at E for the lower part, where low stresses and potential for cracking and hydraulic fracture due to differential settlement are likely. Potential failure paths can also be associated with high permeability layers through any other portion of the embankment. The figure on the right shows some common locations where cracks or defects are often observed. The worst location is usually where two or more factors combine. Understanding the design of the dam, given the geology and seepage history, are key. Searching for potential flaw locations is a key step in the risk assessment process. Many concentrated leak erosion failures and incidents occur where conduits are embedded in the embankment. Hydraulic fracturing can occur due to stress distributions resulting from the stiff conduit and its less stiff surrounding soil and low principal stresses. Hydraulic fracturing can also occur on the sides of conduits constructed in trenches and where sharp corners are present in the concrete or concrete surround. Desiccation cracking can occur on the sides of the conduit excavation during construction Poor compaction can occur due to closely spaced collars or concrete formed with a corrugated steel sheet or other non-smooth formwork, as well as at narrow spaces adjacent to the conduit. Poor compaction is likely to lead to collapsed settlement of the soil on saturation, thereby forming a gap adjacent to the conduit. Leaks or deterioration by aging, open joints, or other defects due to corrosion or crack conduits after differential settlements can also lead to concentrated leak erosion as well as internal migration. This slide illustrates situations in which cross-valley differential settlement may lead to cracking or extension strains in low-stress zones subject to hydraulic fracture. As a dam is constructed, the partially saturated compacted soil in the embankment consolidates and settlement occurs. Where the valley sides are steep or have steps in the profile, differential settlements occur and these can lead to tensile or low stress zones in which cracks may form and hydraulic fracture can occur. The areas susceptible to cracking are shown for steep abutments and steps in the foundation profile are shown in the figures on the left. Staged embankment surfaces can also behave like a step in the foundation profile as shown at the right. Tensile zones develop during the varying stages of embankment construction. This can lead to cracks at depth but which then close up as additional fill is placed. The following sequence of slides shows the development of minor principal stresses from finite element modeling as an embankment is constructed above a bench in a steep abutment. It should be recognized that these stresses are inevitable, even in well-designed and constructed dams, and are not caused by poor design or construction practice. 
The following animations progress through modeling of embankment construction. As fill is placed in layers, tensile zones initially develop above the rock bench and along the steep abutment. These appear as red and orange colored zones. As successive layers are placed, the tensile zones disappear and go back into compression. Therefore, if cracks develop, they are likely to close up as construction proceeds. However, the cracks can remain open or reopen after construction, even at depth, due to ongoing settlement. As the fill construction nears the crest, tensile zones develop in the fill adjacent to the steep abutment. The tensile zones in the fill adjacent to the steep abutment remain upon completion of embankment construction. Opposite to the previous scenario, more compressible outer shell zones can cause a drag down effect on a stiff core zone, which can induce longitudinal cracking in the core. Longitudinal cracking can change to transverse cracking on the abutments. In addition, longitudinal cracks on both shoulders may intersect to provide a zone of transverse cracking from upstream to downstream across the core. This slide illustrates situations which may cause differential settlement in the foundation of dams, leading to cracking, lateral strains, and low stress zones subject to hydraulic fracture. At the top, differential foundation support conditions across the profile include soil and rock. In the middle, a very compressible soil of limited aerial extent is present in the foundation. At the bottom, differential settlement occurs over the conduit excavation backfill. Case studies provide insights into conditions in which cracks have been observed in embankment dams. Most dams settle less than half a percent in the 10 years after construction, as illustrated by these two figures, which is less than those in which cracking has mostly been observed. At the left, many dams with cracking experience 1% to 2% post-construction settlement as a percentage of the maximum embankment height. However, cracking was also observed where post-construction settlements were significantly smaller, but other unfavorable conditions generally existed. A similar plot of post-construction settlement was performed for 20 Corps of Engineers Louisville District dams. J. Edward Roush Dam experienced settlement adjacent to a spillway wall, and Mississinawa dams experienced settlement due to internal migration of the embankment into the foundation. This table provides likelihood factors for maximum settlement measured anywhere in the embankment, expressed as a ratio of the maximum embankment height. This table can be used as a starting point, but the risk team must develop project-specific, more likely and less likely factors to guide subjective probability estimation. Evidence from the analysis of case history data indicate localized strains greater than 1%, and in particular greater than 2%, are likely to be indicative of conditions conducive to transverse cracking. The valley profiles with a step in the upper part of the abutment, or with part or all of the valley with compressible soil in the foundation, are most likely to be susceptible to cracking because of larger strains and localization of strains. Based on the results of parametric analyses, this table provides some general conclusions on the conditions likely to result in larger localized strains. As shown in the figures on the left, cracking or a gap may form adjacent to walls due to the earth fill settling away from the wall during and after construction, especially with steep walls. Deformations of flexible or under-designed retaining walls, for example, those designed for active not at rest earth pressure, can also lead to cracks or gaps. Where there is a wraparound junction between a concrete gravity dam and an embankment dam, as shown in the figures on the right, differential settlements may occur resulting in a crack or gap adjacent to the wall. Monolith sections with overhangs are sometimes used on the upstream and downstream faces and can result in settlement and a gap beneath them. Thus, the effective seepage path length may be reduced to the width of the monolith since full reservoir head would be transferred to the end of the monolith due to the gaps. Cross valley arching can occur in narrow and steep valleys as shown on the left. Vertical stresses are shed onto the sides of the valley, which can lead to hydraulic fracture. The figure on the right is the center line profile of the Corps of Engineers Mud Mountain Dam in Washington. 
The 425-foot-high dam extends across a narrow rock gorge with steep volcanic rock walls more than 275 feet high. Defects in the core consisted of loose zones and voids due to settlement and arching of the core material within the narrow, steep rock canyon. A cutoff wall was installed from 1989 to 1990. During cutoff wall excavation in the deep canyon section, the embankment core material experienced severe hydraulic fracturing under very nominal slurry pressure. Remedial grouting of the core was performed. Vertical stresses in the core zone can be reduced due to arching between outer shell zones which have higher modulus. This is most likely to be a problem for cores with a very narrow width and for soil subject to collapse compression on saturation, such as a poorly compacted soil placed dry of optimum moisture content. For cutoff trenches, concentrated leak erosion of the core can occur at the core foundation contact by water flowing in joints in the rock foundation. Concentrated leak erosion can also occur in a crack or hydraulic fracture across a cutoff trench. Hydraulic fracture in a cutoff trench needs to coincide with an open joint or coarse grain soil layer downstream that provides an unfiltered exit, and hence the assessed probability should consider the likelihood of this coincidence. The hydraulic gradient used in the assessment of initiation of concentrated leak erosion should be based on the estimated hydraulic gradient across a cutoff trench. Small-scale irregularities in the foundation of the core can lead to cracking or low stresses conducive to hydraulic fracture. For cracking or low stresses to occur, the small-scale irregularities need to be persistent over all or most of the distance across the core and have steps greater than approximately 3-5% to of the embankment height. There are examples of these irregularities being formed by constructing haul roads across the core and steps in slope correction concrete. Desiccation cracking is most likely to be an issue in climates with less than 10 inches of annual rainfall, in high plasticity cores, and where there is no surface layer over the core. Cracking is generally not observed, even in seasonal climates with extended periods, where more than 12 inches of granular road base, rock fill, or other non-plastic layer is present. Cracking is even less likely if the road pavement is sealed with asphalt, concrete, or bitumen seal. Desiccation cracking does not commonly persist to a great depth, so it only becomes an issue for water levels near the crest. Desiccation cracking may also occur on seasonal shutdown or staged construction surfaces if good construction practices were not followed, and in soil exposed to drying during construction, particularly if it is compacted very wet. Fell et al. 2008 provides some suggested guidance for crack depth as a function of climate conditions and protective cover. Frost effects include extra water drawn into the soil by capillary action, causing pumping and ice lenses leading to heave and cracking or loosening in a high permeability layer. This may occur on seasonal shutdown or stage construction surfaces if good construction practices were not followed, and adjacent to conduits due to freezing and differential movements even if the soil is well compacted. Core materials most susceptible to freezing and ice lens formation include silts, clayey silts, silty sands, silty gravels, and clayey sands and gravels with a plasticity index less than 12. Engineering Manual 1110-3-138, Pavement Design Criteria for Seasonal Frost Conditions, provides guidance on assessing frost susceptibility of soils based on USCS soil types and laboratory freezing tests on remolded soils. Fell et al. 2008 provides some suggested guidance for crack depth based on climate. The Local Building Code, or Table E-1 of Unified Facilities Criteria 3-301-01 for Department of Defense locations, can also be consulted for depth of frost penetration. Viola et al. 2007 provides an equation for estimating the depth of frost penetration. Cracking, hydraulic fracture, or openings can occur in poorly compacted cohesive soils often compacted at more than 2% dry of optimum. This is particularly so for dispersive soils. The mechanism is potentially of two types. First, the soil behaves as a series of clods with openings between the clods in which water passes. Second, the soil collapses on saturation 
forming a flaw, an open pathway in which the water flows. This is most likely to occur where there is poorly compacted soil against a conduit, but it is possible within layers of soil. This also applies to silty sand and silty sandy gravel soils, which may be subject to collapse settlement, even if the soils are non-plastic, because they will rapidly erode in a crack. In addition, a gap may occur just below the phreatic surface due to the settlement of the soil in the saturated zone and arching of the unsaturated soil over it. Bell et al. 2008 provides some suggested guidance for estimating the amount of collapse settlement as a fraction of the layer thickness and the degree of compaction of the core. Animal burrows can lead to situations where there are nearly continuous holes through an embankment or situations where high gradients between holes may result in the initiation of concentrated leak erosion. In the photos, large rodent burrows associated with assumed beaver activity at Natomas Levee were observed by operation and maintenance personnel. A beaver was observed carrying a large tree branch towards the levee that then disappeared at the toe and reappeared on the opposite levee toe still carrying a branch. Upon walking down the levee slope, personnel found a large entrance hole. An investigation was undertaken to investigate the size, magnitude, and continuousness of the beaver den network. The network was found to penetrate through much of the embankment. Vegetation growing on embankments can lead to situations which may lead to concentrated leak erosion. Decaying roots or roots penetrating into an open joint and cracks in the foundation rock can create seepage pass, and overturned trees can create shortened seepage pass. Root penetration of conduit joints and joints and other concrete structures can open the joints to allow erosion into or out of the conduit or wall. Roots can also clog under drain systems and vegetation in general can hinder visual observation. The hole in the photo at the top right was created on the waterside levee slope by a rotted tree stump. The photo on the bottom right is of a breach due to overtopping, but it exposed large roots that penetrated the embankment. Earth fissures occur where the ground subsidence causes differential settlement. Possible causes include groundwater extraction, oil extraction, and underground mining. Earth fissures can be along the edges of the subsidence area or as shown in the figures where the thickness of the soil deposits vary. Typically, the same locations for cracking under static loading apply to seismic loading, but the earthquake accentuates them by causing additional deformations which occur rapidly. If liquefaction occurs, deformations are likely to be large and the likelihood of cracking is much greater. These may be estimated by numerical analysis methods. The top left photo shows longitudinal cracks along the crest of an embankment dam following the Bouge India earthquake. The reservoir was empty at the time of the earthquake. At the top right, Fujinuma Dam failed in 2011 due to foundation liquefaction or strength loss caused by the Tohoku, Japan magnitude 9.0 earthquake. This is the first case of a dam failure caused by an earthquake with life loss. As a result of the same earthquake, the photo at the bottom right shows the slumped Hanoma River left levee induced by liquefaction. When embankments experience a large earthquake, they often settle and spread perpendicular to the center line. Many exhibit longitudinal cracking and some transverse cracking. These cracks are in the upper part of the embankment. Crack depth and hence likelihood of initiation are a function of both the earthquake and coincident water level, as shown in the table at the bottom left. Initiation of concentrated leak erosion depends on water level and depth of cracking. Pels and Fell 2002 and 2003 and Fell et al. 2008 developed a method to assess the likelihood of cracking due to an earthquake. The likely damage class is first estimated based on PGA on bedrock and the moment magnitude. Then judgment is used to estimate the likelihood of cracking, crack width, and crack depth considering other potential failure modes with settlement-induced transverse cracking. These figures are for earth fill and rock fill dams. There are other figures for hydraulic earth fill and concrete faced rock fill dams, but the case histories are even more limited. Geological processes which can lead to formation of open or infilled defects or solution features in rock include defects related to stress relief effects in the valley sides, 
defects related to stress relief effects in the valley floor, such as valley bulge or rebound. Solution features for rock subject to solution, such as limestone, dolomite, marble, gypsum, and hydrite, and halide or salt, and defects associated with landslides, faults, and shear zones. Geologic and geomorphologic considerations were previously discussed in this training course. Blasting can also induce fractures in abutments, cutoff trenches, etc. Inadequate foundation treatment was mentioned earlier in the presentation. At the top right, gaps in the infill material may form by collapsed settlement of the infill material upon saturation, incomplete filling of the defect, or hydraulic fracture through the infill. The other erosion diagrams are from the independent panel report on the Teton Dam failure. The figure on the left shows that under high water pressure, the pipe is likely to enlarge by separation of the fill from the rock surface. At the bottom middle, an open joint is not sealed by dental concrete or slush grout. At the bottom right, an open joint at a step in the rock surface is shown where erosion would occur even more readily because of the reduction of stresses in the re-entrant corner due to the arching and poor compaction in the corner. Identifying the location and conditions for cracking or hydraulic fracture to occur is still subjective. The state of the art is poor for prediction of likelihood of cracking or low stress zones subject to hydraulic fracture, and it's even poorer for predicting depth and width of cracking and the width of hydraulic fractures. Numerical modeling can help inform judgment, but little research is available on collapse settlement. More and less likely factors. The following slides will cover the geometric conditions that make transverse cracking more or less likely. The figures and tables will not be discussed in great depth, but are instead provided here for future reference. This table from Santos 2014 provides an overview of the various mechanisms for transverse cracks and hydraulic fracture in the embankment from Fell et al. 2008. It includes the initiating mechanism, a sketch of how it forms, and gives a list of factors influencing the mechanism. Similarly, this table also from Santos 2014 provides an overview of the various mechanisms for poorly compacted or high permeability zones in the embankment, taken from Fell et al. 2008. This table was taken from the Best Practices Manual and can be used to assess the likelihood of initiation for concentrated leak erosion. It can be used as a starting point, but the risk team must develop project-specific more and less likely factors to guide subjective probability estimation. The factors in this portion of the table address seepage, soil erodibility, cracking, and sinkholes or depressions. The factors in this portion of the table address loose or soft soil zones in the core, construction practices, core width, differential settlement of the foundation, and foundation profile underneath the core. The factors in this portion of the table address observed settlement, foundation preparation, and abutment slopes. The factors in this portion of the table address differential settlement due to a closure section, seasonal shutdown layers, embankment zoning and overall geometry, and quality of construction and quality control. The factors in this portion of the table address lift thickness, core materials, desiccation cracking, instrumentation, and reservoir operation. And finally, the factors in this portion of the table address vegetation and the age of dam or its length of service. Finite element programs like GeoStudio Sigma W can help assess the potential for hydraulic fracture in the embankment for new construction. By comparing the predicted lateral stresses to predicted reservoir pressures, the likelihood of hydraulic fracture on burst filling of the reservoir can be assessed. The effects of various design parameters, such as degree of compaction, placement water content, removal of foundations, shaping of transverse slopes, and other factors can also be assessed. This table from McCook and Gortrian, 2009, can be used to help assess the likelihood of hydraulic fracture. It can be used as a starting point, but the risk team must develop project-specific, more likely and less likely factors 
to guide the subjective probability estimation. Hydraulic condition for initiation. The hydraulic condition for initiation requires an estimate of the crack location in geometry, the applied hydraulic shear stress in the pipe or crack, and the critical shear stress of the material. The latter will be discussed in the erodibility parameters presentation. Note 2, the typical concentrated leak erosion event tree, assesses the likelihood of initiation. Concentrated leak erosion will initiate when the applied hydraulic shear stress exceeds a critical value. This requires estimating the hydraulic shear stresses in the crack for the water level under consideration, taking into account the geometry of the core and assumed crack dimensions and the location relative to the water level so the flow gradient can be determined. Then the estimated hydraulic shear stress is compared to the critical shear stress, which will initiate erosion for the soil in the core at the degree of saturation of the soil on the sides of the crack. Estimates of crack widths and depths is very approximate and highly uncertain. The assessment requires careful consideration and analysis, probably by more than one method. The International Commission on Large Dams Bulletin 164 provides a summary of suggested likely maximum crack depths and widths due to cross-valley differential settlement or differential settlement in the foundation. It is based on Fell et al. 2008, which provides a methodology to estimate crack width and depth. For cracking that propagates to the embankment crest, ground truthing by visually observing the crest can be performed. However, this is not possible for low stress zones within the embankment. Based on case studies and parametric numerical analyses, valley profiles with a step in the upper part of the abutment and subject to large post-construction settlements are most likely to be subject to cracking. As previously mentioned, estimated localized strains greater than 1%, and in particular greater than 2%, are likely to be indicative of conditions conducive to transverse cracking. He et al. 2019 provides some general guidance on the likely width and depth of cracking based on numerical modeling. Although they will not be covered here, this general guidance is included as the next five slides of this presentation in the course material. Initial estimates of crack depths can be made using analytical methods, but case histories can provide some ground truth of what has actually happened. The table on the left summarizes the results of maximum depth of transverse cracking in dams worldwide performed by Virginia Tech for the Bureau of Reclamation. The table on the right summarizes the cracking observed in dams and some of the factors which influence whether cracking may occur. The figures in this slide provide examples of transverse flaws, pipes or cracks for which the hydraulic shear stress will be estimated. The equation for estimating hydraulic shear stress is shown on the slide and involves the unit weight of water, the hydraulic gradient of flow in the pipe or crack, the cross-sectional area, and the wetted perimeter. This pipe or flaw is assumed to have a uniform cross-section and head loss is assumed to be linear. Other assumptions are listed to the right. To estimate the hydraulics of flow in cracks, an estimate of the crack width and depth is needed. A simplified crack geometry is usually assumed, which may result in very conservative estimates. Sensitivity analysis is strongly suggested. When assessing initiation, consider potential head losses in the zones upstream and downstream in zone dams when estimating the gradients in the crack. For the case of tailwater below the base of a cylindrical pipe or horizontal crack, the horizontal gradient across the core is estimated by dividing the hydraulic head difference by the length of the leakage pathway through the core. A homogeneous cohesive embankment is shown on the left, and the slope of the upstream and downstream faces are used to estimate the length. A zoned embankment is shown on the right, where the upstream and downstream zones are very permeable, for example, rock fill. The slopes of the upstream and downstream central core are used to estimate the length. For the case of tailwater below the base of a vertical crack, an equivalent length must be estimated. Homogeneous cohesive embankment is shown on the left, 
and the hydraulic head loss occurs over length L along the base of the crack, measured from the downstream face to a projection of the point where the water level intersects the upstream face. The slope of the upstream and downstream faces are used to estimate the length. A zoned embankment is shown on the right where the upstream and downstream zones are very permeable, such as with rock fill. The hydraulic head loss occurs over length L across the base of the crack, measured from the downstream face of the core to a projection of the point where the water level intersects the upstream face of the core. The slopes of the upstream and downstream central core are used to estimate the length. An embankment dam may have multiple potential exit locations. An example is a homogeneous cohesive embankment with a partial height chimney filter, as shown in these figures, for the case of tailwater below the base of a vertical crack. If the base of the crack is above the top of the chimney filter, the hydraulic head loss occurs over length L along the base of the crack measured from the downstream face to a projection point of where the water level intersects the upstream face. The slopes of the upstream and downstream faces are used to estimate the length. If the base of the crack is below the top of the chimney filter, the hydraulic head loss occurs over length L along the base of the crack measured from the downstream intersection with the filter to a projection of the point where the water level intersects the upstream face of the core. While the slope of the upstream face is still used, the downstream slope of the chimney filter is used instead of the downstream face to estimate the length. Juan 2006 developed equations for cylindrical pipes and vertical parallel sided cracks with no tailwater. Amlung and O'Leary expanded these equations to include tailwater and developed equations for horizontal cracks and vertical tapered cracks. For cylindrical pipes and horizontal cracks, H1 minus H2 divided by L can be reduced to the hydraulic gradient I. Therefore, the same equation can be used when the tailwater is below the base of the crack, and I equals H1 divided by L. For transverse cracks, the width of the crack, W, is very small compared to the crack length parallel to the center line, X, the hydraulic head at the upstream end of the crack, H1, and the crack depth, D. The width of the crack will be on the order of several millimeters, while the crack length, hydraulic head, and crack depth will be on the order of several feet. If W is assumed to be zero where it is added to these terms, and H2 equals zero for the no tailwater condition in the middle column, the approximations shown in the last column are obtained. Another way to use these relationships is to assess the critical pipe diameter or crack width for initiation of concentrated leak erosion. Once the critical diameter or width is estimated, the risk assessment team can then consider the likelihood of having a pipe or crack of those dimensions. An estimate of critical shear stress is still needed and a range of values should still be considered. Scour can also occur along continuous open rock defects in the foundation. The method for assessing the likelihood of initiation of concentrated leak erosion is just like for pipes and cracks in the embankment. For erosion to continue through an open defect, the joint opening size for a continuing erosion condition must be greater than the D95 of the adjacent soil. However, the hydraulic gradient may vary across flow path in the foundation as the width of the open defects varies, as shown in the series of figures on the right. Erosion will initiate in the narrow defects where gradients are highest, in preference to the wider sections of the defect. The next couple slides will give a brief overview of the toolboxes used to help estimate the probability of concentrated leak erosion. These toolboxes will be discussed in more detail and demonstrated later in this course. The crack width and depth toolbox provides resources and methods to estimate the width and depth of transverse cracks that result from different causes, including differential settlement, hydraulic fracturing, earthquakes, and collapse settlement due to poor compaction. The concentrated leak erosion initiation toolbox calculates the hydraulic shear stress in a pipe or crack and compares it to the critical shear stress of the soil. Multiple crack geometries can be assessed. For parameter combinations where the stress exceeds the critical shear stress, initiation is assumed to occur. 
The toolbox will also calculate the critical pipe diameter or crack width for a given critical shear stress and hydraulic loading. Also included are probability tables developed by Fell et al. 2008 that can be used to estimate the probability of initiation based on the soil classification, the width or diameter of the crack, and the average gradient through the crack. The primary references used to develop this presentation are listed on the following slides. This concludes the concentrated leak erosion presentation. Thank you for your attention.